Hello and welcome everyone coming into the webinar. We're going to wait a couple of minutes before we get started, but we just wanted to say hi. It's really great to see so many of you joining us this Tuesday evening. Seeing a lot of friendly names coming through in our participant list. Great to have you back. Great to see some new names coming through. We're just excited to have all of you here with us. So if you are just entering, this will be the webinar on the Doctrine of Discovery. Um, hoping you're all in the right Zoom room that you want to be in. I know it's a really busy time for folks, uh, so it's really just great to have all you here. And we'll get started in about another minute. So grab your water, grab your tea, your coffee drinker at eight o'clock at night. And if you're this, if you're this far east, have your coffee. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery. My name is Rochelle Friesen and I'm the Canada Coordinator with Christian Peacemaker Teams. For those of you who don't know us, Christian Peacemaker Teams or CPT is an organization that trains everyday people to work in local peacemaking communities that are confront confronting situations of lethal conflict and partnering with them to transform violence and oppression. We want to begin today's webinar with a land acknowledgement. Many of us in this webinar are watching and listening from various parts of Turtle Island, which is also known as North America. Turtle Island has been home to many Indigenous nations for thousands of years, and their land was taken from them through war, genocide, starvation, and theft. We want to acknowledge whose land we are on. So if you do know whose land you are on, we want to invite you to type it into the chat. For example, I am currently on the land of the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, the uh, Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Um, and if you don't know, we want to encourage you uh, to do some research um, to figure out whose traditional land you are on. And it's just great to see the chat popping up looking at how many, how many places people are coming to in this webinar. So for some of us in this webinar, like myself, we are consciously or unconsciously invaders on the land we live on. And we acknowledge that through pipeline construction, government legislation, and even gentrification, land dispossession has not stopped as racism and settler colonial practices continue until this day. In order to move from being an invader on this land to being a gracious guest on this land, we must work together to decolonize. Therefore, our acknowledgement must go beyond words and into action. It is our hope that today's webinar on dismantling the doctrine of discovery will help us along the journey as we work to decolonize the spaces that we live in. So just before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we can't see or hear the participants. So if you have any questions during the discussion, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you move your my, mouse down uh, around the bottom of your screen, there's a Zoom panel there. There should be a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. 
We will dedicate time to answering those questions at the end. And if we don't get to your question, we will be answering them via email. So please make sure it's in the Q&A box uh, so we can do that. So if you write the question in the chat, um, well, that's okay. It does mean that we won't be able to answer that question via email if we don't get to it. You can also submit your questions to, via email um, at any time to peacemakers at cpt.org, which will be pasted in the chat box shortly, along with other important links throughout the webinar. So welcome. We have two speakers here with us today that will be sharing with us about the history and the current context of the doctrine of discovery, in addition, how what we can do to dismantle it. And so I want to invite them to give a brief introduction uh, of themselves right now. And so I'm going to invite Carol to share a little bit about herself. All right. I'm Carol Rose. I'm a white settler in on Turtle Island. My ancestors were among the early waves of Europeans that invaded the lands of the Wampanoag and other indigenous nations, lands that they quickly renamed New England. Um, I currently live on Tohono O'odham land in Tucson, Tucson land that is unjustly claimed by the state of Arizona and the country of the United States of America. I was a CPT reservist for a number of years serving in Colombia and then for 10 years based in Chicago as one of CPT's directors. During that time I connected significantly with the indigenous solidarity work that um, CPT is involved with. And one of my deepest learnings during that time is about the relationship with the earth. The indigenous struggles are almost always, maybe always, deeply tied up with the land. So now I'm a reservist again and currently connecting most with CPT through the Turtle Island Solidarity Network and Borderlands work. Which I'm, I live pretty close to the United States-Mexico border. And um, outside of CPT, I co-pastor a Mennonite congregation. And years ago, a few years ago, Tim Nafziger recruited me into the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition that focuses on indigenous solidarity work, mostly among uh, US-based Mennonites. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, one thing I forgot to add is Alicia is our chat moderator tonight, so she will be uh, responding to questions and dropping links in. Uh, so Tim, welcome Tim. Would you like to share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Tim Nafziger. Pronouns are he and him. I'm a white settler whose Mennonite ancestors displaced Conestoga folks in the early 1700s in what is now known as Eastern Pennsylvania in the U.S., I got involved in Christian peacemaker teams uh, through my Mennonite tradition in the late 90s when I was in high school, became a reservist in 2003. And then Carol mentioned that I recruited her to the uh, coalition. Carol recruited me to be outreach coordinator for Christian peacemaker teams in 2008. And so I did that for four years and then two years working with Carol as interim assistant director, finishing up in 2014 as part of the administrative team and Moving to being reservist, one of the, um, Carol talked about her work with uh, indigenous, uh, you know, indigenous solidarity as part of work with CPT. That was certainly a part of my work as well. And also um, I would say influential is working to help start Christian peacemaker teams work in Europe and watching how CPT Europe realized, oh, our work here in terms of anti-racism is really doing border work on, um, on the island of Lesbos in Greece and was part of uh, helping to do early work there. And more, uh, even more deeply than that, CPT really impact, influenced my, deepened my understanding of anti-racism work, both out in the world and internally, watching how CPT changed, how it did its work and changed its mission, vision, and values through that time. Um, for the last eight years, I've lived on Chumash land here in Southern California. And I've been learning a lot about language rec reclamation and cultural revitalization. 
as the as Shumash folks um, don't have, have have to do a lot of work learning from anthropologist notes um, uh, who interviewed some of the last Shumash speakers um, in the early 1900s. And I've been involved with the Dismantling the Doctrine and Discovery Coalition uh, since 2014, and I'm excited to be wearing both my uh, DDOD hat and my CPT reservist hat here today. Glad to be with you. Thank you so much, Tim. So Carol, the question I wanted to ask you today is, what is the doctrine of discovery? And how has the doctrine of discovery impacted colonialism? And how is it currently being used today? Mm -hmm. So I'm not the ultimate expert on all of this, but I will say that it is some statements made by the church in the mid 1400s first. And those statements gave permission and justification for colonialization, colonialism, land seizure, uh, enslavement, extractive industry, in short, genocide. The doctrine of discovery lays the imaginative framework for how settlers could justify to themselves what they were doing, what we are doing. Um, the church basically gave the go-ahead to what states had already started. And the, at the time, the structure of the church was mostly interested in negotiating between the powers that they cared about, the Christian nations, meaning European nations at the time. So with whichever European nation, according to this papal bull, got there first, they got to claim the land and the people. These doctrines, this doctrine, it empowers European nations and it tries to erase all the other peoples and powers. So even though the doctrine of discovery is statements that were made in the distant past, the doctrine of discovery is currently very much in play. It is the foundation for on which systemic racism and capitalism are built. That Christian nations, read European heritage nations, that is white or dominant nations, have the right to land. And that only the people that those nations recognize as people are people. Other nations are not nations. Other peoples are not peoples. They are property. So the doctrine of discovery is kind of, I think of it as the center of the web that is the paradigm that over the centuries has expanded and tightened into white supremacy thinking, cultures, and structures. It is something that ca has captured white people's minds and permeates the structures that we create and tend and poisons even our best intentions. So I think of the doctrine of discovery as a power that has something of a life of its own. Um, Christian biblical language sometimes talks about principalities and powers that need to be named and noticed and bound and dismantled on the way to justice. The doctrine of discovery is also current permission for the extractive industry that is still very much in play. Um, Tim, if you would show the clip from the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition's uh, um, documentary that talks about that, that would be great. Within this legal structure, international development, uh, economic arrangements, economic uh, treaties, they're based in the assumption that some people have the right to own and control territories and lands and other people do not. So we say, I go when you want
we're just going to get it set up momentarily. Here we go. In a pleasant day to all of you. I am Pia Makling Malayao, and I am an indigenous Bontok Igorot from the Mountain Province, which is in northern Philippines. I am part of CAMP. It is a national alliance of indigenous peoples organization here in our country. The Spanish colonizers imposed the Regalian Doctrine. This is uh, similar, if not the same, to the general doctrine of discovery, which also declared the entire Philippines as owned by the King of Spain. For during the post-colonial government, the Regalian Doctrine uh, was retained. The Philippine Constitution declares that all resources in our lands in the Philippine territory are owned by the state. So if we would look at uh, the issue of mining, with um, liberalized mining institutionalized by the Mining Act of 1995, which practically allows for up to 100% foreign ownership of our um, mineral resources and our mineral lands, actually poses the biggest threat currently to our rights to ancestral land. But there's hope when indigenous people hold the title to their ancestral lands. I lived um, in the Philippines with a host family of indigenous people who were Ikalahan Kalangoya was the name of the tribe. You could see the outlines of the ancestral domain, like the, the literal borders of it by the forested area. And all around it was like logged and all around the outside, lots of erosion and landslides. But the ancestral domain, because the indigenous peoples there had gotten a secure land tenure agreement, the Ikalahan Kalangoya were able to protect their forests. And I began to see kind of the importance of, um, of land title for indigenous people. There is interest. All right, so there's more of that. I, I think you're gonna find in the chat, the link to that documentary. Um, but I'll say that in colonial nations, that means like Canada and the US and like which ones aren't post colonial nations. Um, the legal systems are set up by precedent. Current de legal decisions need to be based on what was decided in the past. The doctrine of discovery is the legal precedent for all colonial land claims. It is what those land claims are based on. And it has been cited as recently as 2005 by the US Supreme Court in deciding land claims. I understand that the principle of discovery was cited as recently as 2012 by the BC, uh, British Columbia uh, Court of Appeals in Canada. So this is very much still part of the legal um, process. Um, and much of that legal displacement is right over the top of treaties that speak directly to the contrary. Um, this summer, there was a phenomenal online conference called Mother Earth's Pandemic, the Doctrine of Discovery. And Tim is going to show another short clip that addresses from the, the address by a Haudenosaunee elder or Orin Lyons, who has been a key leader bringing attention to the doctrine of discovery over the last 50 years. He, in this clip, is holding the actual treaty, the treaty belt, that is the legal agreement between his nation and mine. Um, we'll also put a link to that in the chat. Thank you, Alicia. So before I play this, I actually want to correct. Um, I'm putting a link to Oren, Oren's um, plenary. This is actually a colleague uh, of him, uh, of, of Oren's Jake Edwards, who we'll be hearing from in this clip, um, looking at the actual relationship between the Haudenosaunee and the US. agreed upon 
that they promised that this land would be ours forever. So we listened and we talked and we negotiated and we came up with an agreement. And in this agreement, A little bit more of the history of America before they were called America, um, the United States government. They were sometimes referenced as the 13 colonies, Continental Congress. And prior to that, what you don't see in the history books is also what they're called, they call themselves the 13 Councils of Fire after listening to our Gainas at Gona and how govern, governance works. Democracy, the democracy of the Haudenosaunee was shared with the newcomers of these colonies that were growing on the East. And so they took with them their concept of a council fire. And they called themselves the 13 councils of fire. And also you'll see somewhere in the history, you'll see it today behind the judges, behind the President of the United States, who we have a name for, Hanadagayas, Town Destroyer. We give that name to George Washington because of his attempts and his action to destroy our villages. So if I can just add a bit more, Carol, about that clip. For me, what was powerful about the whole conference, which I hope you'll check out on the link we shared, that was our most recent Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition gathering, is that the way a number of the Haudenosaunee presenters shared really decentered our own understanding of history and recentered, particularly the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy, um, and you know the physical piece of ha having that wampum belt and holding it while he talked about what it meant when it was created, you know, over 200 years ago was very powerful. Yeah. So the doctrine of discovery has not yet been revoked, neither at its source in the, the Roman Catholic Church or the rest of the church that has grown up out of that same root since then. Um, nor uh, most of which has grown up since that, out of that root since then. Uh, nor by most of the systems that took it, the doctrine up as their justification. There is a movement to repudiate the doctrine of discovery that you can join. And um, in some ways, the doctrine of discovery becomes the shorthand for both the legal precedent and all of its evil offspring. Um, I'm gonna jump down and just say we have many guides in this work the land itself, all life, all our relations, life in and among us, indigenous leadership, including nations and individuals, the UN uh, Declaration of the Rights of the Indigenous People that is a collective work of indigenous peoples and read well and decolonized, even the Bible can guide this work. So I'll throw it back to the next question. Thank you, Carol, for that very quick summary. Um, so, Tim, what can we do to dismantle the doctrine of discovery? Well, Rochelle, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, I think there's a couple of different uh, areas that we want to touch on. You know, first of all, um, learning. And obviously, you all are doing that by, by being here today. Um, We'll share some resources in the chat uh, from study guide work that the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition has done over the last few years, particularly trying to reach a Christian audience. But we've also found that the Doctrine of Discovery documentary that we showed a clip from earlier has been seen thousands of times because if you search for Doctrine of Discovery on YouTube, it's the first thing that comes up. So it's, it's interesting how you can reach beyond where you first expect to when you do the work of, of studying and sharing that. We also, um, many of you may know of the blanket exercise that was uh, that was first created by Kairos Canada and is now shared more widely. Uh, we also supported the development of a 
act of live theater, a play called We Own This Now, which you'll see a link to in the, in the chat. And it really, what we're trying to do is come at this story and do education work in a variety of ways. Because people will go to a play who won't, you know, tune into a panel like this and other people might tune into a panel who won't come another, you know, access the information in other ways. Um, and then connecting, you know, what are the protocols for interaction and visiting with your indigenous neighbors in the place where you're at? In what ways have they invited settlers to connect with them? Um, and that can be the form of, take the form of cultural centers, um, public gatherings like powwows or even monthly bingo games and also solidarity actions. A lot of those, uh, those of us on Turtle Island have followed the actions of First Nations in so-called Canada over the, uh, the blockades over the last couple of years, Idle No More in the US, uh, Standing Rock was a very prominent blockade action, which was uh, opposing the pipeline here as, and then there was continued actions that happened around this continent uh, following up from that. I also wanna specifically offer a shout out to Sarah and Jonathan Nahar. Sarah is a former director of Christian Peacemaker Teams and she and Jonathan, who's a CPT reservist have done a lot of work with the coalition and they were the folks who really made the connection with the conference, the Mother's Earth Pandemic Conference in August that the coalition uh, was planning to attend in person and ended up attending uh, virtually doing solidarity work that flows out of their connection with local Haudenosaunee work in uh, Syracuse. Um, you know, land acknowledgements, which we did at the beginning of this call are a simple way that have really, I think caught on more widely in Canada than they have so far in the US, but they're starting to become part of gatherings here. And you can even do that even when you introduce yourself, uh, if, the, if the context feels right in other contexts and say, oh, you know, I'm Tim, I'm from unceded Chumash territory in so-called Southern California. And it's a simple way to inject that um, into, into life. And of course there's repair work. Um, we have connected, uh, actually we'll be doing some fundraising work at the end of the year here with a coalition with a land re return. Um, some of you may have heard of Dakota scholar Wazi Adawin, um, who's been doing a lot of land return work. And so as a coalition, we've been learning about the history of land return in the various contexts where we're at. And um, John, Carol, what is John's last name? I'm blanking, sorry. Stace. Uh, John Stays, one of our coalition members has really done a lot of fundraising work with Wazi Adawin's land return project. Um, and that's, often a better place to start with than an apology because an apology can be feel kind of hollow unless there's something concrete that that goes with it and then um as i've uh, you know going deeper into what solidarity action looks like um it really there's lots of opportunities to support indigenous communities resisting domination and genocide um carol are you going to share a little bit more about oak flat uh, partly later. Okay, great. Um, so for me locally here in Ventura County, that's looked like being involved in efforts to take down a statue of Father Junipero Serra, who's actually a Catholic saint who was involved, who was the founder of Ventura, the mission in Ventura in the late 1700s and responsible for the genocide of a lot of Chumash people here and other indigenous people up the coast. It was kind of a trail of death and genocide um, wherever the missions were planted. And uh, we were successful in removing his statue from in front of City Hall on, on city land this summer as part of the wider Black Lives Matter movement, which had a lot of implications for indigenous folks as well, who, um, who took action up and down the California coast, focusing on statues of Sarah in particular. I think more broadly, I would just say that I think networks like Turtle Island Solidarity Network and the Dismantling of Doctrine and Discovery Coalition are so important, um, particularly because I think it's important that we're not only dependent on, we're not always just looking to indigenous people, but also have networks among people who are um, settlers who are doing this work, but both white and people of other ethnicities who are settlers on this land so we can learn from each other and support each other in this work. And so I would say that over the last six years, just participating in networks like this and learning from each other and supporting each other and, and challenging each other to go deeper in this work is a really part, a really important way to be part of dismantling the doctrine of discovery. 
Thank you so much. A question that's coming through is just if you can explain it more, Carol, is the doctrine of discovery a physical document? Was it a proclamation? Was it a declaration? Um, because it's been so rooted in like historical yeah. colonization, current colonization. But what is this actual doctrine of discovery? So I, my understanding is that it's actually two papal, like Pope statements that were made in the 1400s. If you know otherwise, please correct me, but that's my understanding. Um, so there is a, a document. Um, if you can read Latin, you can read it. <laughs> it's been translated many times. Thank you. So again, we're gonna move into our Q&A portion. Again, if you have a question, uh, please go down to the Q&A button at the bottom. You'll see like two little chat icons it's, and underneath it says Q&A, right there you can write your question, you can include your name, you can submit it anonymously, um, but that can give us a chance to get back to you if we don't get to your question. So I'm wondering if both of you uh, one of our first questions here is, if you can say more about your local connections as you work to dismantle the doctrine of discovery and how does it land in your life and where you live? Mm -hmm. So um, I moved to Tucson like five and a half years ago. And um, from the beginning, kind of out of that learning from CPT, uh, learned, like sought out the learning. What are the protocols here? What, who are the people of this place? Um, and then started listening to what are their concerns and what are they trying to do and what are they struggling for? And there are pieces of their, the work that is calling them and, and where they're paying attention that they really don't particularly have interest in settlers being involved and that's fine. But there are pieces where they want allies. Um, one example is the border wall um, that is one of Trump's uh, big promises and activities um, cuts the, the, the nation of the Tohono O'odham people in half uh, physically, like the, the border, they cross, the border crossed them. Um, and in the not distant past, that has been a um, vehicle barrier, but not one that kept relatives from visiting each other or kept, it didn't keep people from going to visit sacred sites from either side. Um, and the border wall does that. So supporting the resistance to um, that. Uh, and some of that, um, like on my part, is kind of local organizing here and um, uh, uh, encouraging restitution in the direction of act activists who are the front line there. Um, another is Oak Flat. Uh, this is an area where um, the San Carlos Apache, it's a little bit north of here, uh, it's sacred, a sacred site to the San Carlos Apache. And um, uh, the US government claims ownership of that area. It is a national forest. Um, it is unceded land. It was uh, land from which the San Carlos Apache were uh, removed in the 1800s. Um, the US Congress a couple of years ago, several years ago, um, uh, promised that land to Resolution Copper, a, um, an international uh, copper mining corporation. And the San Carlos Apache are actively resisting that because the, the type of mine that they're planning would completely hollow out under, the, under Oak Flat and the entire area would subside, um, including like water that currently flows year round, which is an amazing thing in the desert. Um, so and if you could 
put in the chat the, the place where you could go and sign the petition to reverse that or congressional action. I would appreciate it. There it is. Um, so that's something you can do even if you're not from the United States. Please feel free to tell my government what to do <laughs> along with me. I know you shared already a bit, Tim, but did you want to share a bit more? Sure. Yeah, there's two things I would highlight. I would, um, for me, a really important part of my local involvement has come through, um, I was part of founding uh, Showing Up for Racial Justice chapter here in, in my area in November of 2015. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that organization, it does a lot of work specifically organizing and educating white folks around racial justice issues. And so that became an opportunity to, to find out about um, local actions that were happening, particularly around this, uh, during the Standing Rock Solidarity period. That was an opportunity to connect with local indigenous activists, both Chumash and indigenous people from other places. Um, and then specifically something that's really interesting here that I've learned a lot about, I'm gonna put a link in the chat to an article about my friend um, Matthew Vestudo, who's a Chumash leader who's done a lot of work around language revitalization because there isn't, um, there aren't people alive right now who grew up speaking the different Chumash dialects. And so he's, I've um, driven a number of times around our local watershed with him as he as kind of a driver for his place name um, tours where he'll actually take uh, mostly non-Indigenous people, but some Indigenous people as well to different places in our watershed and say, oh, this is the name of this place and here's a history of this place. Um, and that's a really powerful way to, to bring a different lens um, to the landscape, especially here in a watershed where there's a lot of oil and extractive industry to say, oh, there's a different way of looking at this that isn't just about how we can extract oil, or I would say even when it comes to water here, that can be a very extractive approach to water because it is a very scarce resource. And so that's a way of actually shifting the lens, the way in which we view that, view the land that actually comes out of a relationship with not just Matthew, but also the work that he's doing. And, and I would say the kind of the, the cosmovision, if I can borrow the language of a, another indigenous friend of mine to actually see see the world differently. And for me as a Christian, there's ways to recover that cosmovision in our own tradition. And I would say reappropriate our tradition from empire uh, for hundreds if not thousands of, of years. And it's really fascinating to see the way that then begins to dovetail in beautiful ways with a more indigenous cosmovision. Thank you. So another question is, how are these papal bulls still valid? Like. Why haven't they been repealed? Like what's going on with this? I could take that one, Carol. I mean, I think it's really important to understand, I mean, Johnson versus McIntosh is the 1815 decision that's so critical. And um, that's a really highlighted in, in the play, who owns this now that we've mentioned, but you had a one of the Supreme Court justices was actually a land speculator who had made huge amounts of money just taking land, you know, buying land from the US government that was at that point had no settlers on it and then selling it to settlers. And so there's a court case where a settler had bought the land directly from indigenous people. And also a different settler had bought it from the US government. And that was Johnson versus McIntosh. And so the Supreme Court of the US said, oh, you know, we're not gonna recognize the ability of the indigenous people to sell their land at all, right? And so that was where it entered into, you know, the, the Catholic church frankly could do whatever they wanted at this point. It does, you know, it would be significant if the Pope, you know, repudiated the doctrine of discovery, but there would be a whole separate process to get it extricated from U.S. law. That's much, where it's much more in city and U.S. and Canadian law, frankly. And and you shared a little bit about how it became part of the law, because otherwise there's no just legal justification for non-indigenous people to have any any land other than perhaps what's covered in treaties. And treaties don't cover most, the vast majority of land in the U.S. in particular are not covered under treaty. So that's why when we use the word unceded, that essentially is is code for stolen due to the doctrine of discovery. Thank you. And the U.S. Johnson uh, versus McIntosh case was also used in Canada as precedent um, in British Columbia. And I'll post that link later in the chat. 
Uh, so another question I have here is just wondering if you can talk a bit more about your experiences with CPT and how it's shaped your Indigenous solidarity work. Um, I can speak first to that since you were just talking, Tim. The, um, so I feel like my time in CPT, um, I really intentionally kind of tried to focus on how do we shift the core, shift from, uh, sorry, how do we put dismantling racism, undoing racism at the center and then see what happens? And in 10 years as director of, of working that direction uh, with many other people, I learned from other people about where I need to change. I learned from other people about how the structure of the CPT needed to change. And all of the work that's kind of out there sent me home. Um, so I think it really, it really the, asked me to ground myself where I am. And um, my partner some once told me he, he like, he feels like now I'm just, now I'm a local partner. I, I just live here and I do the work here where I am. Um, uh, not meaning a local, indigenous person, but um, someone who does the work right here, where, you, where I live. Um, so thanks, that's a great question. Um, I just put a link in the chat to a report I wrote after I co-led a delegation to Grassy Narrows in 2011. That was a really influential visit for me. And I remember even in CPT training, being really encouraged to learn also PCC Wukong, this really important, uh, that's the, it's the indigenous word for grassy narrows. And that's part of, I think, how throughout my experience with CPT, I was learning that different lens. Another story that ties in with what Carol was talking about um, that I think is so, um, is, is powerful is that there was, I don't know, sometime in the late 90s, there might've been Mennonite Central Committee and CPT organized a delegation of indigenous people from this continent to go to visit the Hebron project in the West Bank. Um, and those, some of those indigenous folks reminded CPT, you know, this stuff has been happening on Turtle Island for hundreds of years. Why aren't you doing work here? And ironically, it was also Israeli settlers who would say to CPTers, you did this stuff in the US, why are you coming here and bothering us? And that, as part of that, that, that push, uh, that challenge from indigenous leaders, as well as settlers that we were in very much uh, opposition to, that was part of um, drawing us back to this work. And the last thing I would say is just that, I think that CPT also taught me that we, we do this work sometimes, we begin this work often out of a sense of challenge and responsibility and I think I also learned a lot about the opportunities for authentic relationship that can come when you do the work over the long haul that are, that are also um, can change us deeply. Thank you. So we tend to focus on government, but what is the role of corporations that implement, that influence government policies and the legal system? Uh, so for example, in BC, British Columbia, uh, corporations often use court injunctions to override indigenous legal title to their lands. Um, we're dealing with a bit of this right now uh, in Ontario um, at 1492 Lambeck Lane. Uh, so what is the role of corporations in all of this? Um, well, like I, the story or I, what I described with Oak Flat, government gives the title to the corporations very often. Um, I mean, whether it's through the legal system or through Congress in that case. Um, uh, corporations 
are the ones that are currently in the forefront of enacting the seizure and the destruction and the um, the actions that lead to physical death of the people and land. And, and I think beyond that, I would say that there's an opportunity through challenging the doctrine of discovery to actually get a challenge the rights of corporations to not only the, the title of the surface land, but also the minerals underneath it and who really owns that. So we are getting some really great questions here. Um, so here's another question. Is there a different colonization and implications for the doctrine of discovery between Spanish versus English colonizers and Catholics versus Protestants? There's a, a little piece of the um, Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition documentary that shows how um, well, the early um, implementers of the doctrine of discovery were from Catholic nations. Um, England, which was already Protestant at the time, uh, followed the same rule and followed, like acknowledged the papal permission uh, in explicit ways when um, the uh, royal decrees asked for colonization of um, uh, that part of North America. Um, so I both followed, even though it's um, the doctrine of discovery per se is, is a statement within the Catholic church. Um, early Protestants that had left that fold still acknowledged that source as um, legitimate uh, legitimization. One of the things I'll add to that, that really I learned in a new way from the August conference that, I've, that, that Orrin Lyons and others, the Mother's Earth pandemic organized, the Mother's Earth Mother Earth's pandemic conference that we've got the link to in there, they always use the phrase, the Christian doctrine of discovery. And one of the reasons that they do that is because it reminds us that this is a complete utter failure of the idea of the separation of church and state that, that is here. And furthermore, Christian in that time essentially meant settler, meant European. And so it gets really hairy when you have even more recent legal scholars citing the doctrine because it's it's explicitly Christian and it, it just when you when if you when you start thinking about it as the Christian doctrine of discovery, it really um, starts to do things to your brain in a new way. If you're like, wait a minute, why are we citing this thing as part of the legal structure? Of the, as it's a core legal, not just any legal structure, it is the foundation of private property on this continent. Um, it's it's really shows the lie. Yeah, and not only this continent every place colonization went forth. So when we think about the, the history of the United States, I mean, you just get a whole web of intersecting oppressions. Um, so you have the doctrine of discovery, the genocide of indigenous people. You also have slavery. So how do we bring these two horrible oppressions together uh, and talk about restoration, talk about resistance. How do we put these things together um, and bring about things like reparation or land back? How, how do these things sort of coexist um, and how do we resist together around these topics? So um, it was also the permission for the um, uh, chattel slavery, like the doctrine of discovery was the permission to take African people <laughs> captive and, and enslave them um, and indigenous and other indigenous people. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do reparations. Um, 
and they need to be in a context of relationship. So I'll talk just briefly about what the congregation that I lead has done about reparations. A couple of years ago, um, we were doing studies. We, we, did the, we did a worship series and we did studies. And then um, I thought maybe the next step would be to repudiate the doctrine of discovery. But the treasurer, God bless him, said, no, let's make this real. Let's, let's put it in the budget line. Let's put it in the budget. So we're a small congregation. Every year we have $1,000 for reparations. Sometimes we think of it as um, taxes that we're not paying, rent that we're not paying. Um, and each year we uh, distribute that to, um, we have a, we worked out some, in, in a way that does not pit indigenous people against each other and that does not make them uh, do any grant reporting or applications. We just like this fall, when the um, autumn, Tohono Autumn Anti-Border Collective started doing nonviolent direct action at the border wall, we were in a position to have our indigenous solidarity group within the congregation say, uh, let's give them $500 and they used it. Um, so, it, it puts us in a position to respond to needs as they arise, but also to kind of um, continually keep our eyes out for what's happening and where they're, yeah, where it makes sense to distribute in a, any particular time. And I just put in a link in the chat to an article about the Segorite Land Trust in the Bay Area which is a model that a lot of indigenous Californians are pointing to for reparations um, that I think is, is a great project to check out more if you're interested. In um, the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition is um, coming, is working right now on a, a resource about reparations that will be useful when it comes out. Please, Carol, share that with all of us when it comes out, because that would be very interesting. Um, another question is, what does nonviolent direct action at the border look like and at the border wall? So because of a combination of COVID and the nature of the road out there <laughs> and the nature of my vehicle, I have not physically been there. So I could... Um, I'll post a link to the, the Facebook page, but there, there's, there have been arrests. There, there was an attempt to um, stay out there that was uh, um, cleared out basically. Um, it is led by the, uh, by uh, autumn people who are from that part of the, the nation. Um, so the, the nation has different clans and groupings. Um, so it's it's the part of the nation that is in the part that that is where the wall is being built right now. That is uh, people from that area that are um, giving leadership. There have been um, uh, road closures by allies and autumn um uh standing where the construction vehicles park so that they can't go out in the morning and uh standing in the road no, it's between Ajo and the border which is also blocked effectively blocks them getting to the uh construction site Thank you. So we have time for one more question. And I mean, the doctrine of discovery was used to take over the land and to displace people from their land. 
Has there been anything happening in terms of returning the land um, back to indigenous people, whether it's through social justice groups, church groups? How has land return uh, been playing out uh, specifically in the United States? Carol or Tim? Carol, can you take that? I was just finding the Facebook page for the Anti-Border Collective. Um, I mean, there are a lot of different things happening in different places. So it's a little hard to pin that down. And that's not been an area that I've been uh, directly active in. Um, I think you referred to um, the uh, project that John Stace has been part of and WAS. Um, can I actually highlight um, in the chat, Yanni Delgado is pointing out this history of active involvement in specific acts. And so I just commend we haven't mentioned, but we have this like seven or eight panels that we circulate uh, mostly around Mennonite churches, but in other places that kind of tell the longer history that we haven't been able to get to that includes Spanish colonization, that includes English colonization, French pieces, and the history of border boarding schools in particular. And that's a really simple resource that you can just request from us. We mail them to you. You can put them on walls wherever they're at. Um, I don't know if we have that on our website easily, but those are actually like museum quality panels that tell this story because we have a great graphic designer and a coalition. And I think it's really important to tell the, as much as possible as that whole story. Thanks, Yanni. So my apologies to the folks that didn't get their question asked. We are running out of time, but we will save the questions and we hope to email uh, you a response at some point. And again, you can always email peacemakers at cpt.org. Um, if you have questions, if you're someone like me, your question doesn't come up till the day after you sit through a webinar. Um, so you can always feel free to send us your questions then. So thank you so much to Tim and Carol um, for all the knowledge and wisdom that you shared with us. Thank you to everyone who listened and watched. And if you would like to share this webinar with your community or rewatch it, we will be sending out a copy to you in the next couple of days. Also, if you ever want to watch our previous webinars, they are featured on our CPT action page. Um, and there will be more webinars coming down the road. So please keep an eye out. Um, as mentioned, feel free to email us your questions. Also, a huge ask is to follow us uh, or to follow CPT Turtle Island Solidarity Network on Facebook. This has been an incredible week of resilience and resistance against colonialism. You have Mi'kmaq lobster fishers enacting their treaty rights right now in Nova Scotia, facing violent settlers. Um, I know we have a few folks that really follow our Palestine work. Um, these Mi'kmaq lobster fishers are facing violent settlers as they try and enact their treaty rights. The police are often standing by and doing nothing. Uh, and so we are trying to do as much as we can uh, to support the Mi'kmaq lobster fishers. We also have 1492 Lambback Lane still going on. Uh, so what has happened there is a development firm uh, bought, in quotation marks, uh, Haudenosaunee land that had not been settled as a land claim yet, and they were planning to build a suburb near Caledonia. And so the Haudenosaunee have reclaimed the land and they've been on the land and the land defenders and their allies have been criminalized. Um, many, many people have been arrested and charged trying to drop off supplies. Um, our good friend Skylar Williams is facing a lengthy, lengthy criminal case. His next court uh, date is October 22nd, which I believe is Thursday. Um, and there should be some creative actions popping up uh, that CPT may or may not be doing in the next coming weeks. So you can learn more uh, through our Facebook page and we will be sending an action re request out 
later this week for everyone to get involved in. One last thing is as at CPT, we believe in making this knowledge accessible to the public. Our spaces of decolonization should be spaces without a price. Therefore, we provide our content for free. However, as CPT, we do rely on donations in order to keep up our accompaniment work and to keep it alive. Uh, and so we also wanna make sure we can keep all of our educational opportunities accessible. Therefore, if you are able, please donate. Thanks again for joining us and we will see you next time. <laughs>